Well, hey there, it's Liz Rohr from Real World NP, and you're watching NP Practice Made Simple, the weekly videos to help save you time, frustration, and help you learn faster so you can take the best care of your patients. So this week I'm gonna be talking about pancreatitis, the general um, approach to diagnosis, as well as the clinical presentation and kind of the steps to take from there, including some lab interpretation. So um, to start, the, and I have my notes here to the side, so I'm not misspeaking at all. To start, there's three main causes for pancreatitis. So um, gallstone pancreatitis, and the pathophys behind that is that there can be, the thought is that a bile, a stone is getting stuck in that area and there's a backsplash of bile into the towards the pancreas. Another one is chronic alcohol use, and we don't really know what the pathophysiology behind that is. It's not necessarily that someone has a copious amount of alcohol and that it triggers pancreatitis. It can, sounds like it can happen just any old time. And full disclosure, I've actually only seen historical pancreatitis in primary care, not a patient in front of me. It is not that common. But I think it's important to talk about because unless we have that full understanding, we won't necessarily know what we're looking for, right? Um, especially with patients who come in with epigastric pain, which is the main symptom, which comes in literally all the time to primary care. <laughs> and we always order the labs for it, so let's let's make sure that we know about it. Um, but anyway, so about half of patients will have radiating pain to the back. It's usually a, an abrupt onset, like within days. Um, and the gallstone pancreatitis tends to be an even more abrupt, more localized uh, reaction in the right upper quadrant with an onset of really rapid severe pain in 10 to 20 minutes. Again, thought to be related to a moving stone of some kind. And then the chronic alcohol-related um, uh, pancreatitis is more of like a diffused, like poor, less less well localized, but still a, an acute onset, but not necessarily as rapid. And then the other main cause that I didn't mention yet is from high triglycerides, and so those are the top three causes. But alcohol and gallstones are the 75% of all of the cases. So the clinical presentation is again a, a sh uh, an acute or rapid onset of epigastric pain. Half of people have it radiating to the back. About 90% of people actually have nausea and vomiting that lasts several hours. Um, and then some people can have some dyspnea related to diaphragmatic irritation. And then some people can have jaundice if there is a uh, gallstone that is, st uh, that there's a stone stuck in the bile duct. So those are more severe cases to watch out for. And before I go any further, actually, it's really important to point out that pancreatitis is not something you're gonna mess around with that I do not recommend. I have not seen it myself in real person, real people in front of me currently having symptoms. So I recommend any, it's just not that common and it is really serious. So I do recommend if you have suspicions of this to get your colleagues or supervisor involved. Again, putting ego aside and just making sure that the patient safety is paramount. But yeah, in terms of the physical exam, I mean, it's it's typically pretty severe abdominal pain um, on palpation as well. And you're always watching out for peritoneal signs, right? The guarding, the rebound, um, really severe pain with like barely, barely touching their abdomen. Um, and there's mild, moderate and severe pancreatitis. And like I said, this isn't it's not that common in primary care. And so if I were to see this, I would do my full assessment and my exam and my evaluation, and then I would definitely get somebody else involved. In terms of the mild, moderate, and severe cases, I would definitely be running that by somebody. Some cases are very mild, um, and they resolve within three to five days with just um, pain control and you know adequate hydration and kind of easing off of food for the first 24 hours of their symptoms and then slowly introducing like a, a soft, bland diet to, to tolerance as they're doing uh, with their pain, but then other people need to be hospitalized. So the severe cases though tend to have um, fever, tachypnea, um, hypoxemia, hypotension. So like those are a little bit more clear appearing, right? I think one thing to keep in mind is that um, some patients basically everybody with pancreatitis has inflammation. That's about 85% of people. And then the other 15%, I'm loving these numbers, I'm a real numbers person, but about 15% of people will have necrotizing pancreatitis, which can lead to a whole host of other complications. And that usually is observed um, on imaging by day three. But let me let me just stop there for a second and we'll work our way backwards. So how are we gonna diagnose this, right? So um, there's three main criteria. One is labs. The other is the kind of a clinical presentation. And the third one is imaging. And textbook says you only need two, uh, two out of three. So if you have those classic signs and symptoms and the labs that are reflective of that, you could diagnose it. But again, I would tread very lightly here and I would take it case by case and consider doing imaging depending on what's in front of you, how long it's been. But I wanna talk about amylase and lipase because I feel like everybody orders amylase and lipase, but I don't know if everyone feels comfortable with it. So, and again, I'm looking at my notes so I don't misspeak. So amylase rises within six to 12 hours um, of acute onset. Uh, the half-life is about 10 hours. And so the problem with amylase is that it's fairly sensitive and specific 
However, because it has a short half-life, if you see somebody, unless you see somebody in the first 24 hours, that's not that useful of a test. I mean, you can still order it for sure and, and use it in comparison, but Lipase, if you have to pick one, I recommend choosing Lipase. Um, hopefully you can do both and you can kind of compare the values, right? But Lipase rises within four to, eight hour, four to eight hours after symptom onset and it peaks about 24 hours and it takes about eight to 14 days to return to normal, whereas the amylase, um, takes about three to five days to return back to normal. So it's a lot riser of a, uh, faster of a rise as well as a fall. So the light pace is gonna be more persistently elevated. So you might catch it um, that way. So the main way that we diagnose um, pancreatitis is it's greater than three times the upper limit of normal. And I talk about this in the lab course, but it's talking about the reference range that you have and that very top one of the top of the reference range, three times that is, is, is considered to be a di diagnostic criteria for um, pancreatitis. So um, other things that you may consider to order when it comes to epigastric pain and looking into what's causing what's going on here, um, in addition to the amylase and lipase, CBC with differential can be helpful in terms of an infectious process. However, um, there can be reactive leukocytosis, meaning the white blood cell count can go high um, just because of the reactive inflammation that's going on. You can also have hemoconcentration, meaning that your hematocrit and hemoglobin will go high because of the fluid losses that can happen in terms of the pathophys. Um, behind pancreatitis. And then you also want to consider, and I mean, I definitely would <laughs> do LFTs, um, liver function tests, because again, you're trying to see, is this, where is this coming from, right? Is this a gallstone pancreatitis? What is the history kind of like, like um, suggestive of? What is the alcohol intake like? What is their triglycerides like, right? So doing lipids, doing LFTs, um, making sure it has AST, ALT, bilirubin, calcium, um, albumin, things like that. So um, hopefully all of those things all together can be helpful, but really the criteria is amylase and lipase. And so if you have classic symptoms with those labs and you can get them back in the same day and they're not having a severe presentation, that is diagnostic criteria enough versus if they seem unstable in any way, getting somebody else involved and deciding whether or not they need to go to the ER. So yeah, so that's the general gist of um, diagnosing pancreatitis. When it comes to imaging, um, usually if people are gonna get worse in pancreatitis, they're gonna get worse in the first three or more, like the first 72 hours of their symptoms, you really wanna make sure that they're not having any symptom decline. So again, in collaboration with a, call, uh, with a supervisor, having a conversation of like, is this acceptable? Especially if it's a good, very slightly elevated amylase and lipase, it was very clear that it was some sort of like passage of a gallstone and they're not, you know, jaundiced. I mean, it's, it's all complicated. So I would just kind of like leave it there. <laughs> And then kind of take it take it forward, but typically just for informational purposes, um, they usually decline within the first 72 hours because the, about 15% of people can have that necrotizing pancreatitis, which can lead to the further severity, which can lead to the complications, um, and there's actually a 5% mortality rate. So anyway, um, most people, like I said, do get better if it's mild. They can be managed outpatient with a um, with pain control, adequate hydration, and uh, staying away from food in the first 24 hours, and then reintroducing a soft diet depending on how their pain is. But I would not recommend doing that without anybody setting eyes on the plan of care because I would not do that myself. So that is it. That is the whole thing about pancreatitis. So if you are struggling with labs, if you love labs, well, if you love labs or you're struggling with labs, <laughs> you should definitely join us for the lab interpretation crash course. Um, we cover the main labs in primary care, CBC, CMP, uh, including those LFTs and the CBC you ordered, urinalysis, TSH, lipids, and the main endocrine labs in primary care. And it's open all the time. And there's also a Facebook community that goes with it, as well as live Q and A's to review abnormal lab results. So um, join us over at realworldnp.com slash labs. Thank you so very much for watching. Um, let us know what questions you have and I will see you soon.